as I walk through the door, I sensed his presence. And I know this was the place where love abounds. For this is the temple of our God We are standing in His presence on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. And I know that there are angels all around. on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. And I know that the angels all And we are on holy ground. Let's all get our hymnals and turn to 154. What a friend we have in Jesus. 154. All three verses.
beautiful song that is. Thank y'all so much for being here tonight. I know we're in for a wonderful blessing. Uh, if you didn't meet Brother Gary and, and Audie uh, earlier today, you'll have an opportunity to do it tonight, I'm sure. But we certainly want to be in prayer for Brother Gary as he brings God's word to us tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight to thank you and praise you, Lord, for all you've done for us. Our voices would completely be exhausted were we to try to list all of the things you've done for us. And Lord, you've done things for us that we don't even know about yet. And we thank you, Lord, for how you, from eternity, had our best interest at heart, not only in providing forgiveness of our sins, but Lord, giving us an abundant life starting right now. And Lord, we thank you so much that through Jesus, you've made all that possible. Thank you that he is that, that friend, Lord. And Lord, tonight we pray for Brother Gary as he brings your message to us, to us tonight, Lord. We pray that we'll listen very carefully. And Father, we pray that in Jesus' name, that Father, some, some new truth or some old one that we've not learned yet or that we've learned and forgotten might be sent like an arrow to our hearts. If Father, you would anoint Gary with your Holy Spirit as he shares your word. We thank you, dear God, for hearing us and for loving us so lavishly the way you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue singing by turning to 628. He touched me. Both verses, 628. Good hymns.
out of the way just a little bit it's kind of like a one-eyed bandit staring me in the face oh first of all I'd like to say thank you Rocky for allowing me to come tonight and and share with your people um, really means a lot to me I've known Rocky I don't know 15 years 20 years I don't know when I first came to this part of the country met Rocky when he was working at the at the bookstore and and even at the bookstore, Rocky was always a, 
a big help to me and to my family and and I just appreciate him. You know there's a there are a couple of things that that Rocky and I are alike in. Both of us are getting older. You know, both of us are getting stiffer. You know, that's part of that. But there are some differences too. Rocky has hair. I have little hair. <laughs> you know, and it's those kind of things. But one thing we have in common is this. We love Jesus. And that's the most important thing in our life is to love the Lord that has loved us and gave His life for us. Now there's Jason over there. You know, I am so glad that Jason is marrying my daughter. I can finally have a Baptist son-in-law. <laughs> my other one is Methodist, you know. And um, I don't know what we're going to do, but we love Jason. And, and, and I'm going to ask you, you know, Shelby will be moving over this way and... Uh, Y'all treat my little girl good. That's my baby. You know, and uh, I t I've already told Jason, you know, if you marry her and you mistreat her, you see these shotgun shells? I flipped them to him. I said, next time they're going to come a lot faster. And I think he believes me. But I, I love Jason and, and, and have learned to love Coach and Judy and... And um, they're just wonderful people. And, and I'm glad that my daughter has found a godly man. I prayed for her since she was born. I began to say, God, have you heard my prayers? You know? Because both of those, you know, are getting a little on up in the years. And I, I at least wanted one grandchild. You want to hear some good stuff, come when we get married. I'm, it'll be good. I want you to take the Word of God tonight and turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. And I'm not going to ask you to stand up tonight, uh, but I ask you to listen closely. And I, try, I, I give every message a title, or two, or three. It, it just depends. You know, if I preach it here, it's one thing. Next week it might be something else. But I, I entitled the, pa the, the sermon tonight, Upper Room Men. Upper room men. And I took it from here in the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 12 and following. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were say, staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we break open the bread of life tonight, might you bless us in a way that we were not expecting. Father, might you fill us with the Spirit of God. Might you call us, Lord, to be more like these upper room men. That we might be men and women that you can use to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world. In your name I pray. Amen. Another thing about Brother Rocky and I, uh, I Brother Rocky is, is uh, when he preaches, you know, he's kind of gentle. Uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, I may be down there with you or something. You never know about me. And if you see my wife waving me, she's telling me to get back where I belong. But uh, I penned this message back in 1998. And I was packing stuff up the other, well, a week or two, two weeks ago. And I ran across this message even before I knew that I was going to be here. And as I saw this message and I began to look at it, and I began to read over it, I said, you know, I need to preach that. Somebody needs to hear, hear about the upper room men. Have you ever wondered about those men that were there with Jesus? Uh, have you ever wondered about their personality or about their lifestyle or their home life? Many times I've thought about those men and I've looked for those characteristics in other Christians. 
Because I think those men who, first of all, were called by Jesus have something that we all need. First of all, they were redeemed. Uh, uh, Jesus called them, then he redeemed them. Uh, they were open to the will of God. You, to serve God, you must, first of all, have the call. A call into salvation. Because without salvation, you're not going to do anything for the kingdom of God. Uh, it, that's that being redeemed part. Being born again. And when you're born again and you've been redeemed, if you will allow the Holy Spirit, it will open you up to the will of God in your life. You've got to be willing to open up and let God step in and take control. There are some characteristics about these men that I look at when I'm thinking about Bible study teachers, revival preachers, anyone that's serving within the church, there are some characteristics that I like to look at because I think that it's important that we try to be upper room people. Wouldn't you like for everyone in this church to be like those disciples? Uh, they came from every walk of life. And as you look around in here tonight, there's probably someone from every walk of life. I don't know if there's a tax collector. But I'm sure there's some that, that lived mm, very questionable lives at one time before God got control of them. But these men that were called of God, that were selected by God, that answered the call of God... First of all, they were teachable. They were eager to learn throughout the Word of God. As you listen to these men, they were always asking questions. You know, as a little child, I always asked questions. Uh, that was, the teachers used to tell me, just a minute, wait. Uh, I'll tell you in a... Would you stop asking so many questions? Can you imagine what those disciples did, those upper, upper room men did, as they were walking with Jesus, and Jesus was doing all these miracles? Can you, God, how did you do that? Jesus, why did you do that? What is the significance of that? They were always asking questions. Uh, they, they were teachable. And they wanted to be instructed in the ways of God. You see, when Jesus called them, they recognized that there was something simply wonderful about this man. Do you remember the day that Christ came into your life? Do you remember the day that, that the Holy Spirit began to convict you of those sins? And, and as that Holy Spirit was there and working on you, uh, maybe you weren't sure what it was and, and, and you just sat there and thought about it for a minute. I remember the day that Jesus convicted me of my sins. I can tell you the minute, the day that Jesus Christ came into my heart. I'd been in revival. And that night, as in a lot of revivals, you know, when the youth start coming down, a lot of times a whole bunch of them will come at one time. I said, well, you know, I don't want to go down with them. I am just not going to walk the aisle with all of those young people, with all of my friends. I don't want anything, anyone, anyone to think that I'm doing it because of them. Well, I went home and I, I pondered this thought all night long. Didn't sleep school day. We were having morning services too. I woke up, my pastor lived a quarter of a mile, a half a mile, something like that across from me. And I ran to his home and I knocked on his door. And it was very early in the morning. It was slightly after 6 o'clock. And I was banging on his door and he ran to the door. He said, Gary, what's wrong? I said, Brother Donald. He said, what? I said, I've got to get saved right now. He said, right now? I said, right now. And I'll never forget the pastor. Another Donald was there that was leading the revival. They took me into 
Our pastorium was not real big, so the dining room, and there was a big piano in there, because Donald's wife taught piano. And there, it was an old upright Steinway, and we knelt in front of that piano on that old piano bench, and I asked Jesus into my heart. Never forget it. Most wonderful thing in my life. I mean, it was an awesome feeling. Couldn't wait to go to school and tell my friends that I got saved. That I didn't just, I'm not just going to get baptized, but that I had asked Christ into my heart. I wanted them to know that I had made a, com a commitment that Christ was alive in me. And I wanted to be instructed by God. And that's why we need people from the upper room to instruct new Christians. We need people that are willing to be instructed, that are uh, willing to assume the responsibility for the spiritual upbringing of these Christians. So many times we have people teaching classes that really ought not be teaching them. You know? And sometimes the, only, the reason they're teaching is because someone that should be teaching refuses to do so. Well, these guys were teachable. They were willing to be instructed. And, and as they listened to Christ, they were like a big old sponge. You know? They were just, they were just sucking it in. Taking all that they could get. We need to be like that. When, when your pastor is preaching, when your Sunday school is, teacher is teaching, and, and by the way, I enjoyed Sunday school this morning. Uh, I, I, I did. The, the, the teacher, the, the facilitator was good, and, and the men in there were awesome. I loved it. And that's what it's to be about. We're to go to Sunday school for what? To learn biblical truths. Things that we can use and carry out into the world and to share with a lost and dying world. Secondly, these guys were inspired men. They were inspired men. They were inspired by God. Listen, and in that inspiration, they became firm in their beliefs. How many times are you around a Christian that really doesn't know what they believe? Uh, you know, a lot of times in our churches, uh, people don't even know what Baptists believe. And you know, we, we, we have a uh, Bible study on the uh, Baptist faith and message to teach us what Baptists believe. We ought to know what we believe. It's in, I mean, it's important. If you're going to share with someone, you've got to know it. I mean, if you don't, uh, you're just going to mess up, you know. We have the Jehovah Witnesses. We have the Mormons. Listen, I want to tell you something. Those characters know what they believe. Now what they believe is wrong, but they know what they believe and they can spout it out to you just like that. And let me tell you what, if you're a born again Christian and you know what you believe, you can say, wait a minute. Let me share with you about my Jesus. And they're going to take off and run. Because they don't want to hear. See, we have to be instructed. We, we have to be inspired. We have to be firm in our beliefs. We have to have strong convictions. Today in our world, in our churches today, and I believe this is one of the problems in our Baptist churches today, we're not strong about our convictions. We go about it, and we have our children, and, and we're raising them up, you know, and we're telling them, well... They come home and they say, well, you know, everybody else is doing this. And we'll say, well, you know, I guess. I guess it'll be okay. But it's not. We've got to tell them, look, we don't believe that way. You know, it's not right for you to do those things. It's not right for you to go to those places. You're a child of God. Would you want God to slip up and find you there? 
You know, would you want me to come in and see what's going on there? These guys had strong convictions about what they believed. They had strong convictions about the Word of God, about what they were being taught, the work of God. They were inspired men. They wanted to go and tell. We ought to inspire young people to be ready to go and tell others about Jesus Christ. Because look, whether we like it or not, whether we want to believe it or not, we're getting a little old. We're getting a little old. You know? And when we begin to get a little old, we need a little help. And where does our help come from? There are churches that are dying because they've pushed the young people out. Because... Older people aren't willing to change. And sometimes change is good. You don't change just for the sake of changing. You change for the sake of growing the kingdom of God. Well, these men were willing. Look, their lives were changed. Uh, here, a fisherman. I mean, where I grew up, fishermen were... Mm. I mean, I grew up in the Delta on the banks of the Mississippi River and those commercial fishermen went barefoot in the wintertime, you know, and, and they were some terrible looking dudes. They lived across the levee on, on houseboats, if that's what you wanted to call them. And, and, you know, when they came in from fishing, they would sell their fish on the streets. The next stop was the package store. You know, have you ever thought about those guys being like that? We don't really know what they were like. We know they were fishermen. And God chose them. God pulled them in. And He began to use them in a mighty way because they were teachable. They were instructable. They were in... Not instructable. Yeah, instructable. Uh, they were inspired by what God was doing. God ought to inspire us every day. People ask me all the time, you know, how you doing today, man? I woke up, I'm great. You ever thought about that? You woke up, you're doing pretty good. Word of God says we're not promised tomorrow, right? I know uh, three years ago almost I had to go in and, and uh, I'm still not sure what all they did inside of me, but uh, I had seven major blockages and they had to take my heart out to fix it because there were so many vessels that were messed up and I didn't know, but, you know, I didn't even know I was sick. You know, went in and but before I went in, I told those guys, I called them all together, the, the doctors and everything. I said, look, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah. I said, do you believe in prayer? Oh, yeah. I said, well, you're going to come see me and pray with me before you put me to sleep. And one of them said, why? I said, because I don't want a heathen working on me. You know? I mean, I want a man of God, you know, that serving God, and all those guys do, they, they serve God, uh, the whole team, and, and they came in and they prayed with me. And you know what? Of course, I don't remember what went on during the surgery, but I know that night I was standing up, marching in place. The next day, people thought I was going home. Three days later, just like Jesus, I went home. And haven't looked back since. But those men were inspired of God. God had called them into the practice of medicine. And they didn't have a problem praying with even the anesthesiologist. That's the one I really wanted to pray with. You know. I said, look, if you're going to put me to sleep, I want to wake up. I said, you know, if I don't wake up here, I said, I'm sure of where I'm going to wake up. You know, but they were instructable guys. Those doctors and those disciples were, were men of much compassion. I mean, I couldn't have had a more loving group of doctors. And still today, they're so loving and so kind. These guys were men of compassion. You know, we think about they fed those in need. Doesn't God call us to do that? If we see someone with a need, aren't we supposed to help them? Aren't we supposed to feed? If we see a widow, or a widow lady, or, 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 or a man, aren't we supposed to help them? That's our job. They were willing to do that. They ministered to the sick. 
You know, when I was sick, people brought me food that I didn't need. You know, I really didn't need some of it. But they were ministering to me. And they were bringing me that food. And they were coming by and, and my men's prayer group would come by and they would pray with me. And, and we still met on Tuesdays and Thursdays like nothing had happened. I might have been a little ashen some, ashen sometime, ashen sometimes, but they would come and we would pray and everything was going to be okay. And I knew that because of two reasons. I trusted that those men that did the surgery on me were prepared and that God was my Savior. And nothing could go wrong. They had compassion. They ministered to me. They ministered to the sick. They ministered to the widows and to the orphans. And today we need to learn to do that more. I'm going to tell you something. Our Baptist Children's Village, every Christmas, needs someone to take some of those little children home with them. For Christmas. Because sometimes some of those little kids, they may not be real orphans, but they're stuck at the Baptist Children's Village with nowhere to go. We need people to step up and to do that. I don't think Jesus would have let them stay. But the, another thing is they were men of courage. They were willing to stand up and tell who Jesus was. I know Peter messed up. But we all mess up from time to time, right? What is the Bible? We're all sinners. Saved by the grace of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. These men were men of courage. Even when they were persecuted... They continued steadfastly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I think Paul should have been in the upper room. You know, he just came a little late. But I think Paul should have been in the upper room because Paul was a man of courage. Paul was a man that continued steadfastly in the work of the Lord even when he was about to be slain, just like John. You know, they realized that they were something that God could use. They loved the work in which they were called. You know, Jesus told them, He said, I'll make you fishers of men. I'll make you fishers of men. Now, I know Coach likes to fish. You know, I, I tried to drown him on the lake. And it didn't quite work. But I know how much he loves to fish. He's like me if he goes to the golf course and, and there's, a, there's a lake on the golf course, you know, he takes his rod and reel with him. And I think that's good, you know. I've caught some of the bigger fish on the golf course before. But, you know, he loves to fish. What if we had men and women in the church that love to see people come to know Jesus like? You know, you got to prepare to go fishing. You got to be ready. My, one of my friends was going to alligator hunting. And uh, his wife came home from work. She says, I'm taking the day off tomorrow. I'm going with you. And he said, okay. She said, are you ready? He said, well, I've got to, I've got to gas the boat up and I've got to put the treble hooks on my, on my rods. And I forgot what else he said. She said, you're not ready. How are we going to catch a, a, a alligator when you're not ready? Don't you know you should already be ready? And she, he said, well, but, but we don't go till tomorrow. She said, but what if something happened today and you couldn't get ready? Folks, there are people in the world today that need to get ready today because they may not be here tomorrow. They not, may not get up in the morning and say, oh, what a beautiful day it is. That's what those disciples wanted to tell people. They wanted to tell them about Jesus. The Bible says that they went door to door. You know, we don't do that much anymore. We, we've come uh, to church with this mentality and it doesn't work anymore. Lost people are going to come to church. We got to go get them. What did the Word of God say? Go and bring them. Beat the bushes, so to speak. Go and bring them in, and and that's what we need to be about doing. Uh, fourthly, they were spirit-filled men. 
Can you tell when a Christian is spirit-filled? Can you, you can look at them and you can see a difference in their countenance. Because you see, a real Christian that is walking, talking to God is not going to sit around looking like they've been sucking on a persimmon all day long. They've got something to smile about. Look, they might feel bad. I understand that. They may not be just right that day. Hey, but we've got Jesus. And if you've got Jesus, you've got something to smile about. You've got a message to share. And people are aching to hear it. Listen to this. People are dying without hearing it. They need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what these guys were all about that Jesus called. They were filled with the Spirit. Not only were they filled with it, they lived in the Spirit. I mean, it was alive in them. And, you know, probably as they were walking down the streets of Jerusalem, everybody would say, here comes old Peter. You know, he follows that Jesus fellow. Look at him. You can tell. You know who he is. The greatest compliment as a Christian that anybody can ever say to you is they walk up to you and they say, hey, you're a Christian, aren't you? Because they see it on your face. The greatest thing that ever happens to me, and it happens, these little ladies walk up to me all the time. I'm a, they used to call me the Walmart preacher. Because I would go to Walmart all the time and visit all the little ladies, you know, in the Walmart, and they hug me and all this stuff. And, and all the time, one would walk up to me and they would say, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, ma'am, you, you're a pastor, aren't you? And it would be the little black ladies and the little... I said, sure. How did you know? They said, we just know. There's something about the way you care about people. There's something about the way that you speak to people. And we ought to be like that. That's the way these guys were. You know, they were persecuted for it. I mean, people looked down at them because they were Christ-like. Because they were of the way. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be looked down on because you're a Christian? I'm telling you. Because God's going to look up at us. And then when we walk through those gates that day, I think He's going to pat us on the back and He's going to say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. I look forward to that day. Now don't rush it. But I look forward to it. When my Savior looks me in the eye, pats me on the back and says, well done. Can't wait. Can't wait. Till after Jason and Shelby have a few children anyway. You know, I need a few more grandchildren, right? Y'all would like one. We don't want to stop with one. I got five. We need to catch up on that side. Um, not only did they feed people the Word of God. They fed them the love of God. Folks, I want to tell you something. Christianity is about love. It's all about love. You see, the Father loved us so much that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on Calvary Street. And that's what these fellows were all about doing. They were filled with the, the Spirit of God and they fed others the Word of God so that they might grow. You know, if a baby does not eat, it's not going to grow, right? I don't have that problem with my grandchildren. They all have eaten well. My children have eaten well. You know, none of us are puny. I mean, we're all... Well balanced. Sometimes we lean a little, but we're well balanced. But these men, these upper room men, they were instructing men. Men, They went and called others to Jesus again. That's important. They went and called others. They were about sharing the convicting Word of God. So, they too would become convicted. 
Now I know Brother Rocky and, and I, I know how firm he is in his faith. And I know what a wonderful guy he is. But when Brother Rocky brings the message, do you think he just brings it to you? If it doesn't step on his toes too, it's not doing any good. You see, and that's the way those disciples were. They, they preached the Word and then they said, Oh my! This applies to me too. How many of you have ever sat out there, you don't have to raise your hand, and said, you know, that just doesn't apply to me. You know, when you're saying that, guess what? It usually does. You're just trying to hide it from yourself. You're trying to hide it from God, and there's no hiding it there. Two people you can't hide from. Yourself, you always know where you are. And God, He always knows where you are. I hear people all the time say, I found God. Hey, God's not lost. You know? He's not lost. He, he knows it all. I mean, after all, He created it. He's not going to get lost in something He created. The thing is, God came to us, and we saw Him. And we heard Him. And we accepted Him. And we took Him into our heart as our Lord and Savior. And that's that convicting spirit that brings us to that point in our life. Finally, but not least, there was one special thing about those guys that I love. They were praying men. They were praying men. Folks, I want to tell you something. You can't pray enough. The Word of God says pray without ceasing. You say, well preacher, I can't drive down the road and, and close my eyes and pray. Well, I've done it a few times. You know, it's not the smartest thing to do, but, you know, and uh, I preach driving down the road. I do that a lot. I sing going down the road, and my daughter and my wife say, boy, we're glad you do it there. You know, but uh, you can pray wherever you are. You know, we, we, we have this thing now, we can't pray in some schools. Some schools, their, their administrators are, are Christians, and they say, hey, we don't care what the government says, we're going to do it anyway. Uh, and that's okay by me because I believe that. But you can pray wherever you are. Uh, there's a restaurant, and I can't remember which one it is. If you pray openly, you know, in their restaurant, they give you a 15% discount. Got a big family, man, somebody's going to eat free. You know, we ought to pray publicly. We ought to pray in the restaurant because the thing is, Someone is going to see that we're praying. They may hear the words that we pray. And it might inspire them to pray. You know, don't be ashamed to pray. Don't be ashamed to get caught praying. Be ashamed to call not praying. You know, a lot of times we'll look, you know, there were so many people here. We don't want to do it. But we ought to do it. Not all pray for a meal in public, but we ought to pray for each other in public. You know, I hear people, well, I don't pray in public. I'm not going to fuss at you, but I'm going to say you ought to learn how. You ought to learn how. Because you never know when you might be doing something. Like you might run up on a wreck and somebody's staying down there in the ditch and you run down the help to help them and, they, and you ask, what can I do for you? You never know, one might say, can you pray for me? Can you pray for me? What are you going to say? Well, you know, I don't pray in public. <laughs> You're going to pray for them, right? At least I hope you would. That's the kind of guys these were. They wanted to pray for people. They wanted to pray for each other. They wanted to pray for the lostness of mankind. I think that's one of those that we miss a lot of times. You know, I think this, we ought to pray for lost people every time we pray. Because they need it a lot more than sick people sometimes. You know, we spend about 90% of our time praying for saints to stay out of heaven and about 10% of the time praying for sinners to stay out of hell. Something's wrong there, isn't it? At least it ought to be equal time. At least it ought to be equal. We have people, you know, call the church. 
so and so sick, will you pray for them that they'll be okay? You know, maybe we ought to pray that they'll be okay with God first. That they get their heart right. That they're prepared, as we like to say, to meet their maker. Because if you're not, it's going to be a bad day. Those men upstairs, they didn't pray for their will to be done. They prayed for the will of God to be done. Now, think about this. What is the will of God for someone's life? What is the first thing you think about? To be saved? To be born again? To know Jesus? Isn't that the first thing? That's the will of God. The Bible says that, that He wouldn't reject anyone that came unto Him. And if He won't reject them, evidently they're worth saving, right? I've heard people say, well, they're not worth it. And I look at them and I say, what makes you think you are? Well, they're just old trash. Hey, look, they recycle trash today and make it into something good. God does the same thing. That's what those disciples, that upper men, upper room men were all about. They were all about bringing people to Jesus. Don't we need a church full of people like that today? You know, if everybody in this room, this next week, went out, told ten people about Jesus Christ, and was sincere and serious about it, wonder how many would show up Sunday? Wonder how many would show up willing to come to the altar and say, Brother Rocky, I need Jesus. Or you never know how many you might witness to that might say to you, you're right, I need to be saved. Tell me what I must do. We ought to be ready. We ought to be prepared. We ought to be prayed up when we see someone like that and be willing to tell them. You say, well, I don't know anybody that's lost. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yeah, if you don't, you live in a world that I don't live in. You know, don't be ashamed of Jesus. These men were anything but ashamed. Now, again, with back to old Peter, you know, he slipped a little bit. And I was thinking, I think God uh, saw that in, in Peter slipping a little bit, that, that, that maybe we would realize that from time to time that we would slip. You know, we're not perfect yet. You remember, some of you do, some of you weren't born yet. I remember many years ago there was the movie on with Bo Derrick, The Perfect Ten. Y'all remember that? Come on, fellas, I know you do. <laughs> right, coach? Coaches, <clears throat> you know, there's no perfect ten. We're not perfect till we get to heaven. And Jesus says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Will you pray with me tonight? Heavenly Father, I pray tonight for each person that's here that, Father, they might take the attributes of those men that were in the upper room with Jesus and they might put them into play. That they might use the plays that Jesus used on those men. What did He simply say? Come. Come. And we need to be telling a lost and dying world. Come. Come unto Jesus. Come, let me introduce you to my Savior. Let Him work a miracle in your life. Father God, I pray for each person here that you might bless them, that you might fill them, that you might encourage them, that you might challenge them to lead others to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Might you bless them this week as they go to their workplaces, to their homes, and to their families. And Father, might they remember God said, You're worth the blood of my Son. And all God's people said, Amen. Brother Rocky, thank you for tonight. Thank you for listening. Uh, I could have preached a little bit longer. Um, you know, 
I'm used to starting at 6.30 and about finishing about 7.30. And I looked up and I thought, well, you know, I'm glad you got a clock back there. <laughs> Thank you again for allowing me into your church tonight.